starting uh, product. And then we each contributed that product to the Apache Software Foundation four or five years ago. So what I'll be going through today, most of this is a part of our open source product. And then if you're interested, I can talk to you a little bit about some of the enterprise features that we provide over and above the core Ignite engine. Okay? So my uh, topic today, as I think Tom introduced, is about how we can add speed, scale, uh, and scale and agility to your solutions. Uh, and some example uh, use cases in analytics, database acceleration, uh, and machine learning. As this slide says right here, so I'm gonna move right along. Um, and then by the way, uh, I am gonna do a demo at the end, so I'll be sitting down and do a few things for you as well. Okay, so for those of you who know Ignite, my apologies, I'm gonna do a little bit of a background on it. Um, and start off with, we all know the current state of systems, right? Data is exploding, both the volume of data, uh, the velocity of data is coming in faster, the variety of data, and the varieties of uses of the data as well. And what are people's expectations? Are they getting higher? And the latency is getting faster, lower, smaller, quicker. Right, so end user are expecting the answer is now, not tomorrow, or not 30 seconds from now, you know? Any millennials here? Those are uh, millennials that are driving this. They want their answers now. So they get everything right away with their, with their face. You're not a millennial, put your hand down. Okay. So, so you can answer either way. Exactly. If I say negative things, you can say, oh, I'm not If I say good things, you can say, oh, Okay, so these environmental factors are putting stresses on our databases, right? So the databases are getting hit with, more, they got more data to serve up. They're getting hit faster and more often because people are writing these progressive web apps, they're using these new patterns, which hit them with lots of IOs, and so we're stressing out our databases, right? We're also stressing out our application development teams. Right, because they're creating new patterns, they're using new tools, they're using a whole bunch of tools at the same time. We used to have one application architecture, right? One technology stack, corporate blessed, everyone used it, and that was it. Now we've got you know all sorts of different application and different patterns being used against the same thing. So lots of stresses that this kind of environment, the expectation of the data, is causing for us. And so that means end users, both the clients that are consuming our data, as well as the application developers are under stress, okay. In memory computing to the rescue, somebody like I have a super shirt, something like that, that's who we are, right? The whole objective for in memory computing is to address those core issues. Now I think Hadoop had it right, in the sense that in order to scale this up, we can't scale up like the teradatas and the exadatas of the world had us do it, right? That just causes us to pay millions of dollars for these fantastically complex big machines. So the scaling up the distributed computer, the distributed cluster, is was really the right answer. Okay. But in addition to the scaling, horizontal scaling, we also need to improve our IO capability, right? And so disks are getting better, but better than disk is closer to the processor, closer to the chip. So in memory, the memory is always going to be faster. They're both going to get better, but in memory is always going to be faster. So in terms of better I.O., in memory is the way to go for that. Okay, and then there's one last thing, which is when you start doing these calculations, you're starting to split the load up. What, did Hadoop, what was Hadoop's answer? MapReduce, right? So MapReduce was the whole idea of the point. Let's map out the problem, split it up, and then reduce all the answers back. So that is a good uh, uh, problem, way of solving that problem. Split join is the Java-based implementation of that, and we call our implementation uh, processor affinity. When you write a query, when you ask for a, uh, an entry out of the database, out of the cache, we need to be able to bring the compute to where the data is. Even if you're using something like something on Amazon, and Amazon can tell you fantastic 
classic stories about dyno DB, sub millisecond or you know, single digit millisecond response. But even when you got single digit millisecond response, if you have to move a terabyte of data through one compute unit, you don't want to be asking dyno DB for all of that data to run it through some longitudinal regression setting. You need to be able to split the answer up. So that for us, that's that's processor efficiency. That's understanding where the data is, being able to split the question, and then assign it to the appropriate node, and then merge the results back. And doing that all in memory. So that's what in-memory computing is for us. Any questions? Moving right along. You guys are waiting for me to get your song singing, right? That's why you guys are letting me talk. Oh yeah, get the microphone. Right? Okay, so I was at uh, the Apache uh, Software Foundation uh, Roadshow just recently, so I just wanted to highlight that we are an Apache project. We are one of the top five projects in the Apache ecosystem. And there are something like 600 Apache projects, I think. I think that's the right answer. Um, and so we're one of the top five. We're getting two million, two million downloads last year alone for the Ignite project. And we're top five in activity, right? So that wasn't just me downloading it again. Okay, so uh, lots of activity. So you can be sure with that kind of activity that this is an ongoing thing. If you look at some of these projects and nothing's been done in two years, you've got to worry about that, right? Because if you're making a technology choice today, you've got to make sure that if you're going to invest your time and effort into stuff, that it's going to be available to you tomorrow, the day after, the month after, next year. So that technology that I was talking about can be used for a wide range of use cases. Uh, we talk a lot. Sorry, question. Are those slides going to be a little bit different? Sorry? Are those slides going to be a little bit different? Are they that big? Yeah, they are. Uh, uh, I'll pay you later. Uh, Tom, are my slides available later? Yes, it'll be uh, available on the GitHub page. Everything I do is for Tom, right? So he owns, he owns me, really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so use cases. Uh, we talk a lot about speed and scale, right? So the tactical or short term use cases is really just getting your database to go faster. So that's at the low end of complexity. That's really, and I'm going to show you that one because it's easy to do. And I'll show that to you very quickly. But then as you move up the stack, there's a whole bunch of other things that are more strategic in nature where having access to this data, larger scale at lower latencies, and being able to put compute through it, unlocks whole potential new applications that you couldn't do before, right? Or just took days to run them, and now you can do them. And now that you can do them now, if I can do them again and again and again, and I can get into some of a re-evaluate print loop, the REPL loop, that you know, the citizen data scientists, the data scientists like to get into that mode. And it's, it's great, I love doing that. And I'll show you that scenario in the demo as well with the uh, Python. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to do a database and application uh, use case. I'm going to do a little bit on uh, the real-time streaming analytics. I'm going to talk about the Hadoop data lake for analytics uh, scenario, and then uh, machine and deep learning. Okay, so there is some terminology that we use, and I'll try to define it for you. Maybe you guys already know this term. Before I joined the company, I didn't really understand the different terms. But so let me just describe it a little bit. So IMDG, in-memory data grid. Right? So the data grid is essentially the definition of having data in the cluster accessible mostly through the Java cache scenario. That's sort of the Redis kind of scenario. Our differentiator is that we actually provide the you know, SQL language available to it. So you can act, ask the question in the language of your choosing. When we load our cache, if you say I want this cache to be accessible with SQL semantics, you just do an annotation at, at define time and it's available to you with 
select insert update delete. So DDL and DML is available. So having access to SQL for sub applications is fantastic. There's a whole category of users that that's their native language. We're older than the rest of you guys, so I apologize for that, but we still like our SQL, right? Then, but caches, um, that language of caches, mostly you know, the gets and puts kind of scenario. The other thing we add to the in memory data grid definition is we also add uh, ACID or ACID level transactional support. So you can treat each table with atomic uh, transactional support. Or you can put five tables, 10 tables, into a long running transaction and make sure that they all complete together or roll back as a unit of work. Right? So that is our classic, our uh, in memory data grid definition. Any questions about in memory data grid? What kind of tool would they use to communicate directly in memory or in application? So we are a Java based platform. Um, so when we create a cluster for you, we will generate a Java project and we will build it into a Docker container, a jar file, or and or run it under .NET container. Um, so my long-winded answer for you is essentially anything you want to write in Java, you can put on top of our service facade. We have a service interface. And so as long as you implement and extend the service inter uh, interface, you can write pretty much anything. You must use Java. It is Java uh, if you want to write it yourself. However, I'll show you later on, we have an API above Java that you can write in Python, R, .NET, C, C Sharp, and send and use our interface to do this. And then you're, there you're dealing with it more as Data, not as, and you can you can get some callable stuff. You can create SQL functions, etc. Okay. And you were saying it can also be loaded in .NET containers. It can. Just keep in mind that what that really is is it's a wrapper that controls and manages the OS to Java runtime that is bundled inside. It's a 64-bit wrapper around a Java JR. So you get some container benefits. You get some ability to, within the Java portion, write some code there to interact with in a native process, in the same process space. Uh, but a lot of the stuff that you might want to do is, is still in the Java side. So you can write C-sharp applications, uh, sorry, .NET applications, and, and call and, and get a in-memory uh, calculation. Um, let me look into more definition of exactly what you can put in .NET. But in this use case, right, would it be better to put it in a .NET container and then use it, or let it run in Java and then and use the API functionality that you were describing? So two answers to that. One is, if your deployment strategy is a Windows-first environment, then .NET is maybe a better solution for me. The second thing is more about what he was asking about. If you are writing services in .NET and you want to interact in, in memory, in the same process space, then that would be a second reason to use .NET. However, I like a container, Java, Docker, Kubernetes environment. And Microsoft Azure has moved full speed into Linux runtime. So I don't think you should shy away from that. And that's a more nat native environment for us. So unless you're taking advantage of what .NET, or .NET can give you, I would stick to pure Java-based and then use containers. That's my preference. Any other questions? It's something that I'm looking to is like business objects or a camera room. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to show that at the end. And the one of the diagrams will, will show that. But yeah, because we support SQL and the JVC and ODC interfaces, yeah. OK, so we talked about the in-memory data grid. <coughs> then the in-memory data base is one level further in terms of supporting database-centric uh, ways of dealing with the world. Our in-memory database has a persistent disk storage. 
so that if the cluster goes down completely because you have maintenance or a data center has failed and you haven't got our data center replicated probably that's part of the enterprise product uh, if you take the cluster down persistence gives the cluster durability and it also has another advantage which is on restart your data will be preloaded and rehydrated into memory automatically so you don't have to reload like you would with other in-memory data caches. So the in-memory database allows you to actually run everything in this product as if it was Oracle, Genji, whatever. Right? So that's a full database with persistent storage with uh, durability. Is there anything else in there that I missed? I do want to reinforce the SQL and no SQL line there. We are, at the core, we are a key value store. But as I said earlier on, if you say you want to, when, you're when we're defining the cache, we will say, by the way, I also want this to be SQL, and we will add the wrappers around it so that you can treat the same data source, not stored twice, same data source in either semantic, either with the get put put all or with the SQL select insert up the data. Okay? So the essence of the memory database with the mention being KT is SQL or key value. Correct. And, and then eliminate writing back to get. So it's just between the application layer and the database. Yeah. Now with the database, we are we by the way, one thing I should say is we pride ourselves as a company on being strongly consistent. All the time, strongly consistent, you can be guaranteed that the data is spread across 10 nodes, 100 nodes, you can be sure that the value that you store there and the results you get are consistent. Okay? We give you levels of atomicity if you want. Your people read serializable, you know, those kinds of things. But our hallmark is consistency. When you treat, trust us as an in-memory database, because the cluster might go down, you know, the power might go out of the data center, we will guarantee that the data, if you said, if we wrote, if we took the insert statement and we committed, we commit that the data is going to be there. So for that, much like other databases, we write it to disk both in the transaction log, the right ahead log, what we call the right ahead log, SQL Server calls it the transaction log, Oracle has the read log, we have the same thing, right? So our right ahead log stores the transaction. When we've done it to the right ahead log, we will issue the commit, and then under the covers, we will make sure it gets written to the proper partition on the right server, on the right node. Okay, so we are guaranteeing strong consistency. So that's different from the eventual consistency. Yeah, we're not MVCC. We, we try to avoid MVCC. We do have a new feature coming out for MVCC, multi-version concurrency control, which is the eventual concurrency. Right? So we have a feature that is in beta right now to support that, and that will give you some improved performance features. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know that. I will say the following. The, uh, there are a couple, the put all uh, API is for high performance write. The insert does not have the same performance as the put all. Sorry? There, there are some Ignite data streamers that will give you much better performance, like an order of magnitude better than the insert. I don't think there's a difference in those in those streamers. The thing you gotta keep in mind is that with the gets, you typically have a very small. 
Um, whereas with the SQL, you can ask for large data sets. So you got to be care more careful with SQL. Very good. Any other questions? Okay. So in the financial sector, ING has been a good customer of ours, and they did ex um, this um, exact scenario where they are um, they had some front end web applications that were not meeting the performance level that the customers want. And so with our tooling and our Ignite Cache, the tooling will very quickly look at introspect your database, create the matching cache and SQL facade to the cache, so table, start it up, and in addition to doing that so that the cache looks like the database, so you just point your application instead of the Oracle driver to the Ignite driver, and now you're getting in memory performance. Same thing, so SQL 99 support. So there may be a few changes if there's some very specific Oracle syntax, but we've done a lot to support most Oracle syntax. Same with SQL Server, DB2, et cetera. And so we can quickly slide in between the database and the application, and it immediately accelerates your web application and take the load off your database. Now one of the things I really like uh, about the product, in addition to that, what more do you want? What more do you want than that? Is the fact that if your web application is also writing back to the database. Okay, well now how do I do that if I've taken the data out and I'm writing to this new thing way over here? Well, when we do this work, we also provide a transactional commit back to the data source. So if you write to the Ignite cache, we will write back to Oracle, and your application will be successful when we know that Oracle has successfully received that. So you're keeping your cache in sync with your third-party persistence. So very quickly, can we get in between, and you don't have to worry about keeping the cache up to date, cache invalidation, complexity that's involved in there. There, there are there are techniques for doing that, um, and that, but that doesn't come out of the box. So out of the box, when we do the import wizard, we don't we don't have the, that built in for you. So you have to use some things like Oracle Streams, etc. Right? You can look at the change data capture logs and re replicate that into memory. We can talk more after that. As long as I don't miss my flight. You might have to come with me to New York if you want to talk longer. Okay. <coughs> so when I'm writing to the database, can I embed it to my cache gets invalidated? Say that again. If you write, no. So if you write to the database, we do not invalidate the cache. No. The expectation is that you will do one of two things. You'll you'll change your data, your application, instead of looking at the old database, you'll look at the new database and start writing here. If, and that's one way. Second thing is, if you write to here, you need to take advantage of some of our techniques for getting change data capture and, and, and reflecting that output. So those are two things. Our wizard doesn't do that second thing for you. So you need to do that yourself. How much wizard do you get? How can you modify the old database? Depends on strategy you're using. Right? If you're using Oracle Streams, it's pretty fast. It's near real time. Okay, so I'm gonna do a demo later, but I thought it'd be good to sort of just visualize what's going on. So here in the black and red is Ignite with its three node cache in this case, or three node cluster in this case. Here is the different APIs, or many of the APIs we support. Okay, SQL, scans and text queries, Jcache for your, eight, your gets and puts, computes and transactions. I'm not sure I like the layering or lack of layering there. But here are source systems, messages, flat files, and a database. And then we have a whole bunch of app dev tools, one of which is our web console. So the web console allows a user to, I don't know if you can read this, number one, introspect the database. So we can see what that is, generate a project, an Ignite project that describes what that is and creates the Ignite constructs 
that map to that. Then deploy it to the deployment runtime of your environment. Docker container, Kubernetes, .NET, Java, KQSE, KDE, what have you. And then load the data for you automatically. Okay? Now that I've got the data, the last thing on the list is consume it. Use it in any of the data sources, any of the APIs you want. REST, SQL, SQL JDC, SQL RPC, Python, etc. I'm going to show you a couple of those. Any questions about my pretty diagram? What sort of speed up can we expect if we connect the LAN over and have a red check or a copy of it? Like you can get the cloud work. Is there any more than that? So we, we like to say somewhere between 10 and 100 times faster, but it depends on so many things, right? So as an example, on my machine, if I have SQL Server and I have sufficient level of in-memory cache in the mm -hmm. SQL Server, because there's a SQL cache, right, in the SQL Server, and then mine, if I run an example on mine, and I've got mine all in memory too, it's a soft, it's a, they're about the same, right? But I have run three, 10, 100 nodes plus, right? So until you start the network effects of the grid, you're not going to take advantage too much. And if you've got stuff already in memory because the caches are small, you won't be reading, you won't be thrashing on your disk as much. So it depends how much data is in, how much is it located here, what, is, what benefits can you get by the scale, what benefits can you get by the improved I.O. of memory versus disk, and then are there any other things that can be done in terms of the compute? Are there things where you can split the thing up with a split join and bring it back? where you don't have to write all of that data into, bring it all back into one application, do a little bit of work for it, even a lot of that work, to get there with the hyper back. Okay. <coughs> How much time do I have, by the way, Tom? More. <laughs> I need it. I've got more. Uh, okay. Take 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, I'll move on then. I'm going to have to cut out my singing, guys. I've been practicing so much. Uh, all right, so streaming and uh, real-time analytics. So what are some of the key aspects to enable streaming analytics in real time? So one of which is you've got to have native and high-performing connections to the streaming messaging platforms of, of the world. So you need to have the Kafka, Camel, uh, MQTT, JMS, or streaming. You need interface for all of those. So we have streamers, high performance streamers for all of those. Those are all. Another huge thing you need to have is you need to have the ability to attach your queries, your computes, your, your questions. You need to be able to attach those to the streams. So we call that continuous queries. That is the ability to write a SQL statement or a query and then subscribe that query to a particular cache. Then if anything changes in the cache, that query will be, reflect, be reflected, and you will get events fired out of the cache. Right, so we need to have protocol support for the streams. We need to be able to take our queries and apply those to the streams, in our case, by subscribing to them. And then the third one is we need to have Spark. All right, so I'm going to move to a new slide <coughs> for Spark. So Spark is fantastic for a number of things. We have great, so I started this conversation about Spark Stream, but let me back up and talk a little bit about Spark uh, to start with. Spark is great, but it has limitations. And that's a lot to do with the way the Linux command line process center view that, that it grew up on. Right? So what we have done is we have given Spark, the Spark jobs or the Spark workers, we have given them access to the in-memory caches. And that's not a localized cache, that is the distributed cache over the entire cluster. So no longer do they have to bring in just a little bit of data into their environment, or a lot of data into their one little worker. They have access to everything distributed across the entire cache, the entire cluster. Okay. In addition to that, a worker in its one small, little, tiny, little lifetime can update the cache 
and other workers can now take advantage of that. Right? So you've now extended the ability, of the, the value of a worker because it can see across the grid and across a, life, a lifespan, not just to get, not just by itself, but it can coordinate with other workers. Additionally, we can take our Ignite caches and embed it within a Spark application, or we can run separate, and then you have multiple applications that work with the, with clust the cluster, and so your lifespan is different. So you can run the application, go away, or get your result, and then do your application again, and knowing that what you've done will survive you. Some of having kids, they survive to past your lifetime. That's what we can do when we embed with uh, when when we are embedded, or sorry, when we run separate as opposed to embedded. <coughs> uh, what else do I want to talk about? That oh, we support both the RDB API. Sure. So think of this red thing as essentially being the cluster. And so a, and a many nodes could hold a table or a cache. So my cache, 100 million rows, could be 10 million here, 10 million here, 10 million here, 10 of them. And then when Spark accesses the data through RDD or data frame, it has access to everything. Well, so then who's managing who? So it's a client are, uh, asking for the RDD. The client is on Spark. Spark. Spark yeah. Okay. So Spark job is going to ask for a particular data set through either the RDD or the data frame API. That can span, doesn't have to be on that node. You can access that irrespective of where the data is. Okay, that's the one thing. And the second thing is, what you do in one job, if you're writing your RDD back, can be seen by another job. And if you take all of this, and if you run it standalone and connect externally, then I can completely go away, come back, and my data is still there. So there's a two different aspects to this. One is across job and across worker. And the other is, even when you go away, when you come back, your work is still there. So one is life, one is about life cycle, and one is about scope and sharing between other jobs. Okay. One other thing we do that I reminded myself by looking at my notes is that uh, the Spark SQL language as well by having a tighter tie to that, we can take advantage of things that uh, Spark can't do natively. So it's, uh, it is notoriously bad about not indexing. Right? So with this, we can add indexes under the covers so the data frames and the RDEs now perform better because we know what you're doing in Spark, in your jobs, but we don't know. We as designers and engineers will know what we're trying to do, and we can then go under the covers and we can add indexes to get better performance. And because of our ability to do data affinity, we can send the job, the request, to multiple nodes to, act, to perform the answer. I'm going to use an app to bring back in. OK, I've got to move on because I probably have 10 minutes left. Uh, American Express is an example of one of our customers that is doing streaming with us. They are a textbook case of what we do and what people do with our, our software. They come in looking for speed and scale. We give them a solution for that. And then as they go in, they say, okay, now that we've solved that first problem, whew, what else can we do? Oh, you've got some data that's coming in from DB2. Let's do that and change data capture. So in memory, as or as data is coming in flight, let's load that into the application. So now your application is taking advantage of streaming data as well. So Ignite isn't two different solutions, 
It's a solution that can expand to you. You want another API? You want to add Python to it. You don't have to redo anything. Just add the Python API. You want REST? Turn on REST. You know, you don't have to implement a new patch, a new solution, a new technology for it. That's what, what we're seeing with our customers. Another customer, another, you know, the sales guys in the back, so I had to put all of his customers on this one. Okay. Third use case. <clears throat> Hadoop uh, acceleration. Hadoop is notoriously bad for uh, analytics because the latency is so slow. Right? The time it takes to spool up a map for these job or even hive uh, is just too slow for most people these days. Right? So we're getting a lot of people saying, oh, okay, we built this data lake. Can you put something on the back end of it to make it fast? That's what we do. Okay. So if you look here, what I'm trying to show is that whether your data is natively in HDFS, whether it's in HDFS and registered to Hive, or whether it's in HDFS, registered to Hive, and it has an Impala facade in front top of it, the Ignite or Gridbean server can take advantage of all three of those and have access to all of that data. And now that it's, you have access to all of that data in a cluster, you have all these consumption APIs, and uh, I think someone was asking me about different types of, five minutes, all these types of APIs. So let's read through the key value, get put, uh, jcache, search and scan against the Lucene index, uh, SQL, DDL, NDML, REST, Java, C Sharp.net, C++, Spark, RDD, DataFrame, Python, Node.js, I'm PHP. I may have missed one, but hopefully I got most. Um, so in many ways, Hadoop is like a big database. It's just slow, right? So much of what we do in terms of bringing it in is like a database. But because of our streaming features, our, our strong Spark uh, integration, we can have tight integration and leverage the platform to get the data in in the best way and much faster than Hadoop. Question. In that uh, American Express case, where you're streaming the data, yep. it's kind of like a, a, a sort of middle layer, so they can perform some the analytics like more effectively. Is that what they're trying to do? Yeah, I'm not 100% I'm not aware of everything that Annex does. I don't know if all of you want to answer that. What they were doing, it was actually a name for a law firm. So it was an Uber based in NDS, and it was just really doing the search processing requirements. So I've got three minutes left, so I gotta go fast. I got one slide left. Uh, so machine and deep learning. So with all that capability on top, with our Python sidekick uh, interface, with our uh, R 
client interface, we can do this. But because you have fast access to the entire cluster, instead of this slow process where you have data scientists pulling small data sets, trying to do their, their uh, learning and their algorithm training on small data sets, deploying it and seeing that it's not as efficient as they want and bring it back and going back and forth all the time, you can do it all in the data right away. We call it continuous learning. Use the, the full data set with the fast access on, for your training. And in addition to that, make sure that your machine learning algorithms are optimized for a distributed compute model. Have the distributed data and then send the compute to all the nodes, let it do all that work and bring it back. Right? So that's what we've done is we make sure that we are optimizing more and more and more of the algorithms all the time so those, they're optimized for distributed compute. Uh, we've got customers who are doing that. We've got some articles about that. We're going to do a demo quick thing before I get the hook. This is show business, so they'll just come in with a hook and just pull me right off the stage. <coughs> okay. You're not seeing it, I'm You're seeing. Okay. I can't drive two screens, so I'm going to have to go back to the duplicate screen. Okay. So we're seeing the same thing. So if I want to import from a database, I can say what did I'm going to introspect the data source where I am. Are you guys uh, Postgres or MySQL preference? Postgres. 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 All right. By the way, it's not MySQL. It's MariahDB. Would you give a different answer if I gave you MariahDB? No. Still Postgres. All right, so Postgres. Uh, 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 I go fast, I go slower when I have to go fast. Uh, Postgres, Postgres. Whew, save the form. Didn't have to remember. Okay, so we're gonna look at our public schema. We have lots of tables there. No, we got one, one table, it's employee, okay? And I have the option to partition this or replicate it. I can take my 100 million rows and split it up over 10 nodes, or I can say, you know what, it's a product catalog. I want it available on every node, so when the join happens on that node, it's gonna be fast because everyone's got the same copy. Logical ones, replicated everywhere. Okay, partition, we're gonna do the partitioning today, even though I'm running on one, one cluster. I am going to do all this stuff, I'm going to create a employee namespace packaging for this. And it has created a imported cluster and it's got a whole bunch of things for me if I want and I don't know the actual various dials and knobs, the names of them, but I want to, I want to go and I want to enable ODBC and JDBC, you know what, no ODBC. No soup for you. Uh, or if I want to you know, change the storage definition, I want to change the, uh, the page size, to get larger pages, all these kinds of things. This can all be done. I don't need to play around with all of that. I can just hit save and download. And now I've got an entire Maven project with a Docker file. So I can, with magic, go over here, file, import maven project don't watch what i'm doing amazing there's the meetup cluster right there and all the maven dependencies have been pulled in and it's been built and i can start it with docker by going over to docker refresh come on baby okay forget about docker i'm going to run because i just restarted him i'm going to go here i'm going to start the cluster i'm going to because this is the way i'm going to do it and in a matter of 30 seconds, I was able to start my look at Postgres, start, create a cluster based on that, go to my cluster configuration and monitoring, go to monitoring, where's monitoring, where are you, monitoring dashboard. And as soon as the cluster starts, there it is. And I've got my employee cache, it's got nothing in it. I have my 
cash load routine that I can run, and I'm good to go and I'm being taken off the stage. Or if I wanted to go to Python, I could run Python with one line of code. I could, I could create a cache. Oh, this is not Chicago. This is not Chicago. Sorry, guys. NY. And run that again, and then go over to my dashboard, and what do I see now? I should now see, oh, there it is. Empty caches with my entries and everything in there. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. Ben's going to be here, so if you have questions, uh, just grab them right now. Uh, and now uh, we're going to have a talk on how to scale non trivial applications. Is that right? Yep. All right. And Jen, don't forget, if you want to register for the uh, PlayStation and the calculator watch. Were you, were you applying to non-trivial? No, no the not at all. Non-trivial. Non-trivial. Yeah, you do non-trivial. So yeah. what I'm going to be talking about is real systems. Not marketing things that work, things that do things, things that take off um, So can we just show up hands? How many of you heard me talking here before? Come up here. Okay, um, so I work at Oracle. Um, technically, I'm a developer. I write C code for the JWS kernel. And um, Oracle 18, I put 3,100 code in the JWS kernel. So I design, build, high performance JWS systems. I also talk to customers. It's quite frankly easy to talk to customers. So I'm a product manager for Oracle in memory, which is in memory analytics for JWS. Um, an in-memory database called Trans10, which is a transaction database, and also a NoSQL database. So I do a bunch of different things. Now, what I'm not going to be doing is lecturing to you, because it's boring for me, it's probably boring for you. So I'm going to be throwing out some ideas, and I'm going to be asking you guys questions. Um, hopefully it's more interesting for you, I might learn something as well. So what I'm going to be talking about um, is scalable systems. Okay? Um, we're going to be talking about basics, you know, what's latency, what's scalability, because that kind of matters. We're going to be looking at the sort of things that database vendors talk about, which are trivial systems. Looks good, great numbers, but it doesn't really work in the real world. Um, we're going to look at best case and worst case stuff. We're going to be looking at a, a customer use case where we you know, had one of the fastest systems in the world, we're trying to make it better, quite frankly. So, um, a lot of my customers talk about performance. Everyone talks about performance, everyone knows what they're talking about. But quite often, they're not all talking about the same thing. Latency is different than throughput, is different than scalability. Latency is how long a single operation takes. The faster the better. Throughput is how many operations you can do per second. Scalability is how much throughput you can give, provide when you add resources to the system. If you have a slow system or a large latency, it's harder to get throughput. You need more connections. If you have low throughput, it's harder to scale. So these things are related but not all the same. So I'm going to give some examples of these. Latency. How many of you guys use SQL databases? Okay. How many, so I was sharing Progress, Postgres, um, MySQL, SQL Server, DB2, Oracle. Okay. Any other SQL databases with this? Any other? You sort of cover most of those? Okay. So most of what I'm talking about is generic enough that it'll kind of apply to any database. But the, the details do matter. SQL SQL, but it's surely compatible. Do not be confused by that. So the point being, we're doing SQL operations. We're doing selects. We've got um, two predicates for the So we're doing our primary lookup. With the time to in memory database, we can do that in under two microseconds. Not milliseconds, microseconds. So the saying, my database is really fast, it's 10 or 100 times faster. You've got to qualify that with what is the latency? What is the throughput? What is the scalability? Because this thing is fast, it's just marketing. So that's just an example with five-year-old Xeon 
CPUs are faster to build. Updates take longer in SQL selects because it's transactional. You might want to roll back, therefore you need to undo. So when I'm talking about a SQL database that's transactional, it does asset transactions to SQL. Don't confuse that with other NoSQL or semi-SQL products that do transactions, but only for NoSQL gets inputs. I'm talking about asset transactions for inserts, updates, deletes, and merges. Don't confuse the two. Asset transactions for SQL is different than asset transactions for NoSQL gets inputs. So that's an example of latency, how fast you can do something. Um, an example of throughput, you've got to think here. How many watts are we doing per second? Um, years ago, people used to use GPCC. What people have been doing for about the last five years is a thing called the YCSD benchmark or workload. And the idea is they wanted to compare the NoSQL databases. So they're doing um, different workloads, be it 50 50 read writes, read intensive, write intensive. Different workloads and then the throughput. You apply different databases to you know, whatever hardware you want, you just need to know that you want, like you need to scale out. The trick is the greater the throughput, the better. The throughput is measured in operations per second because they're not transactions, they're just bits and bits. So the point being, the bigger the better. So how many of you guys are familiar with Cassandra? Okay, nice system, scales linearly, sounds good. The problem is, even though it scales linearly, it doesn't actually do that many operations per second. So you need a lot of nodes to get the throughput. So it turns out, these are the published results, not I said it was fast, this is what these vendors published. And it turns out, last time I checked, Arrow Swipe was the fastest of these, was doing 1.6 million operations per second with the YCSD workload. So it's throughput, bigger the better. So let's compare that with the product I'm talking about times 10. Over here, this is throughput. I've got two machines, I'm doing 2.7 million operations per second. The fastest in the prior screen had eight machines that would do 1.4. So you're going faster with less. Now let's look at scalability. That's two machines. If I add more machines, the throughput goes up. With four machines, I'm doing five and a half million. So as you add more machines, it gets faster. So this is an example of scalability. We've got a known workload. We've got the same fixed hardware. We're just adding more machines. As you add more resource, it scales up. So that's an example of scalability. Sounds amazing. It's also trivial. It's marketing. You've got logically a single table, you're having a single row. It's as simple as it gets. So we've got the best numbers, but it's trivial. Benchmarks are only meaningful if it's doing what you need to do in your business. If you're doing exactly that, this is great. If you're doing something more complicated, this is kind of irrelevant. Here's another example of a throughput benchmark. 80% reads, 20% writes. Scales up as you add more notes. Going very fast, 153 million transactions per second. These are acid transactions per second. We have high availability. We're actually doing seamless replication between nodes for high availability. So if the machine goes down, you don't care. So 153 million transactions per second, 20% of that's pretty impressive. It's also trivial. Single table, operations are doing a single row at a time. So just because you've got big numbers, doesn't mean it's useful. Another example of a trivial workload, if you're just doing reads. In SQL, that's a select on a primary key. On a NoSQL database, that's a get. 1.4 billion of those per second. Impressive numbers, orders of magnitude faster than anyone else. And it's pretty much irrelevant because the real world is more complicated. Okay? So what are we running on? We're running on a pizza box. Two Xeon sockets, some local fast NVMe disk, gigabyte, um, 10 gig internet, bunch of memories. So it's cheap machines, we ran up 64 of those machines. So that's just background. That's marketing trivial workloads. It had low latency, which gave good throughput. By adding more machines, you don't get scalability. 
So that's Mark then, because it's not really useful unless you're doing single table, single row type operations. That's what everyone talks about in TV. TV doesn't do generic TV to benchmark. My talk about my talk is about hard stuff where it's far more complicated than this. So the thing I'm talking about is a SQL database, a relational database that does ASIC transactions and it's highly valuable. But it looks like a single database. The fact that it's spread over many machines would make things happen. You just get SQL, it just works. You don't care where the data is, you don't care where you connect, it just works. So this works as a standalone database or as a rewrite cache of the database. That's the deployment tool. You choose to manage it. Okay? So, the scenarios I'm talking about. First of all, question. Who of you is a lot Does anyone know what a lot of is? Okay. Someone who uh, someone who is not into technology or big technology. Perfect answer. Perfect answer. So none of you are Luddites. Therefore, probably all of you are customers of this technology provider, which I've been working with. Okay? You may not they don't want me to say who they are, but you Statistically, most of you are probably customers of these, these guys. Um, so, they've got an incredibly complicated system, an incredibly complicated data. I'm looking at a teeny tiny portion of it. But it's a performance critical part which makes them money. If this bit doesn't work, if this bit goes slow, you as customers get ground it. So, not sure how good you are with colors, the sort of greenish stuff and bluish stuff and whatever that thing down the bottom is. The point being, that small part of the data model is for the query part of the workflow. There's another seven tables that are for the right part of the workflow, and that's a very really small subset of the huge number of tables they have. So the point is, it's relational, lots of tables joined together, hierarchy all over the place. So, I'm not sure how, how well you can see this. For those four or five green tables, we're doing a join of full tables, and we're doing a left out of join. So, who can tell me what a left out of join is? Anyone? Yep. Have you ever joined a No. So much of the here is going to be left table gets left in the result. Oh, I've got all the rows of the yeah. left table. Yeah. yeah. So more of the rows from the left hand side of the uh, table gets picked up even though they don't have a matching right hand right. side. Correct answer. But the point being, it's not, but it's pretty simple in SQL, but if you want to go fast, that's the sort of thing that slows you down. So the point being, we're doing a full table join, we're doing a left out join, and we've got hundreds of millions of rows. So, you will use SQL databases. I don't care which database you use, I don't care which hardware. Give me a guess of how long that join takes. You've got hundreds, hundreds of millions of rows in those four different tables. Give me a guess. Anyone? I would say log n. Log n um, No, I'm talking latest. How many seconds, milliseconds, hours will it take to do that join? Give me a guess. There's no right or wrong answer. For your system, how, much, how long do you think it will take? Join log. To do a join. Yeah. Between two. Uh, There's four tables. This is the SQL. We're joining four tables. Oh, okay. We've got a where clause and we're doing a left out of join. For your database, how long would that take? 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Can you do that? Can anyone beat 10 seconds? Okay, is 10 seconds a reasonable amount of time? Okay. But I want to go faster than that. It doesn't really matter what I want. The customer who runs the system that you will use doesn't want 10 seconds. They want it really fast. We're doing this in about a third of a millisecond. The output of that is the input bind variable to this SQL, pretty trivial SQL. And the output of that is the input to that SQL, which has got some predicates. All of that happens in way under a millisecond. That's why Amazon is so fast. Then. Sorry? That's why Amazon is fast. Um, can you qualify by what, why Amazon is fast? What do you mean? No, no, I'm saying like it's your question about Amazon, right? Because of their range is I didn't say anything about Amazon. No, I know you didn't. I'm just assuming. 
played the basketball and didn't count. This is about two years old, still currently fast as CPU. So you got you got fast CPU, you got 256 threads per CPU socket, way more than Intel. So if you've got four sockets on a box, it's a thousand cores. That's a lot. Um, 64 gig L3 caches. The bigger your L3 CPU cache, the faster you go. Because an L3 cache is faster than main memory. 16 terabytes of RAM, lots of local NVMe disks, lots of infinity band, and lots of Ethernet. Pretty good hardware. So the series will scale up. This is what the customer currently uses. They need lots of this. So that's the scale up. The scale out, this customer is sufficiently large that they try everything. They try all the hardware from everyone, and they try all the databases from everyone. And they have people, that's their full-time job. Um, they use a lot of Cassandra. They've got lots of Cassandra clusters in production. They know what they're doing. So I got dragged in to do a benchmark against NSQL. I thought, cool, sounds like fun. So NSQL had been on site tuning this system for six months. So this is pretty serious because there's a lot of money involved. I thought I was going to benchmark against some NSQL, so it's a little more complicated than that. So they said basically, take the fastest hardware in the world and go faster by scaling out. And I said, I said cool. What cool hardware is they going to give me? I love playing with hardware. They gave me VMs on OpenStack. How many can you use on mobile OpenStack? Okay, private cloud software. Open source, cool, it works. We've got a VM using Neutron Network Service. So we've got double virtualization. It's cool, it's cheap, is it fast? Not so much. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, so we've got a bunch of VMs, 32 cores, that's nice, 64 gigs of RAM. This is the in memory meter. When you do stuff in memory, it is potentially as fast as you can go. The more you stick in memory, the better. Each machine only has so much memory. When you use it, is it a memory and it's to go to another machine, you have to do memory pop. Memory pops are always a million bits while we're doing stuff in memory. Memory pops slow you down. In my opinion, memory pops are evil. Okay? So, we've got 16 terabytes of memory and we've got 32 gigs. Okay? Is this a fair fight? So, let's look at the best case. The customer gave me this system, they gave me the data. They didn't give me the data because that would be illegal. They scrubbed the data off me personally and we tried to get it. That way, I didn't get in trouble, they didn't get in trouble. But the point being, we architected such that all the data, all the reads were local. If you have big enough nodes, you can make a copy of the database in each node. But all the SQL reads and writes can be local. That's good. When we read or write from disk, we use local disks because that's fast. Um, we had, you know, Xeons, 24 gigs. We tuned the database. The app was not tuned. The customer gave me some Python from Oracle. I didn't touch it, didn't understand it, it was a little complicated. Just ran. And it did 11 million transactions per second. I thought, good, I'm done. I'm done. It took me a couple of days, I'm done. They said, no, it's too simple. Because each of the VMs they gave was only 32 gigs. Hundreds of millions of rows times all those tables times the width of the table, and they were white tables, did not fit in 32 gigs. Did not fit. So you need to spread the data across the nodes. That's a good thing. All the marketing said spread the data across. That's a good thing. You can process in parallel. Processing in parallel, but you know, talk about the Duke. The Duke is great. You've got a problem, you farm it out, you process it in parallel, and you get the answer back. It's also full batch processing. But if you want the answer now, in a second or a millisecond, the Duke is not the answer. Okay, so you want to process in parallel, but you also want to minimize network. Because you've got small VMs, you have to do network hops. Network hops slow you down. So the point being, because you've got really small nodes, and I used a 10-node cluster, 
what that meant that was on average 90% of the time it was remotely controlled. So what that means <coughs> is, doesn't matter how fast your node is, 90% of the time you're going to go across the network to get all the CDK. This is real world. This isn't marketing. This is what actually happens when you've got complicated joins in lots of cases. Very different from the marketing. So you take a few things. So, 90% of the time it's remote to get the data. By the way, instead of having a local fast disk, you've got remote disks, which is cheaper. So if you remember, they can tap with you in Cinder, um, they give you in set, which was a bit of a nice save out. They try EMC, they try to get it printed out for what they do to get this fast. So you, you can remember Cinder block. Okay. So, did all that, did a bunch of tuning, 304k transactions per second. Now, I'm not trying to put the R on that, but 304k is a lot smaller than 11 million. Why is that? Why is it slower? Anybody? Why is it so much slower? Who was listening? Anybody? Yep. No. No, but it's not. Slow, it's slow. What about the memory? Okay, can you do it? Three downs. I did it with lots of memory, it was local, it was fast. Because the VMs were small, it didn't fit the actual Ethernet cost. 11 million versus 304 k difference is the memory. Okay, so this customer wants to go faster, but their architects and their infinite wisdom said 32 gig VMs are the perfect size. Not the performance, the cost. Okay, so how do we compare? This supercomputer did 240k transactions per second, and they were IO bound, and they were doing ACID transactions. MemSQL did not go as fast. They had 37 nodes. So how many of you familiar with MemSQL? Yep, anyone else? It's a good system. It does SQL, it does it memory. They spent six months, they used more hardware, and they couldn't go as fast as the scale system. With my system scale out, they gave me a goal of 300k, but 300, you know, once I got over 300k, I stopped. Because I don't have any time to lose the um, I was doing asset transactions with two phase commit. If I didn't take a database and divide it into 10, because one machine went down, you'd lose a tenth of your data. That would be bad. So you have multiple copies of data. So if one goes down, it doesn't matter, you can keep processing. So we're doing asset transactions with two phase commits. We only needed a 10 node cluster. So I, one benchmark went on, the customer then said we took more machines, they took 30 machines, re ran it, it went faster. It could scale. It was the two that just wanted to see it. Couldn't do it. Um, Cassandra. I don't actually know how fast it went. Their response was they last for that particular workload doing all those joins. It wasn't a good technology fit. So if you've got Cassandra where you've got to denormalize everything into the cat table, you've got lots of rows. If you've got lots of rows and little VMs, you're going to have lots of VMs. You need lots of VMs to do more memory cuts. Cassandra was network bound. MemSQL was network bound. LT Times Key, everyone was network bound. Everyone was doing network bound for moving data and for IO. So if you're network bound, anything you do that requires more network IO, this is going to slow you down. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about how I optimize the system to minimize network IO so that it could scale, so that it could work. Does that make sense? So I started off with marketing. I believe there's real systems and there's real engineering consequences. Now I'm going to say sort of techniques to improve things. And hopefully all the techniques I'm going to do, you're going to go, so what, I know that. A lot of it's common sense, and that's a good thing. But first some questions. What's the key line here? So we have a hard stop, which is when we get to, you're going to check this out. So, some questions. The first query, you're doing a select 
from a table, a primary key lookup system, and return one wrong. If we're using SQL, a client machine is doing a SQL select with primary key lookup to a remote server. How many round trips is it going to take? Is it one, two, three, lots? We're not sure. It depends. Who thinks it's one? Who thinks it's two? Who thinks it's one? It's one. Okay, who thinks it's two? Three? Not sure. It depends. It is possible to do it in one. But it's actually database specific. If you look at dumb database, it will take at least three round trips. Because in SQL, you have an execute, a fetch, and a false. If your database is smart enough, you can tell it, do all three operations in one go. Make sense? If you are returning a result set from many rows, how many round trips is it going to take? Anyone? Just one or two. Okay, if, I, if my result set was a million rows, can I do that in one round trip? Okay, so this is where it gets tricky. Logically, yes, you can do it in one round trip. How many of these packets is that going to take? Probably many. Because this is a large result set. Or think of another thing. If you're returning a single row, and that table was really wide, and had lots of calls and blocks, logically you may do it in one round trip. But how many packets is that going to fit into? Probably more than one. So there's logical and there's physical. So the point is, there's a bunch of different cases. Let's go to the number five. You're joining four tables, and you're returning a result set of one row. How many round trips? How many client server round trips? It depends. For all the reasons I've said before. Now think about this. If we have a single database and we do rich client server round trips, we've talked about how many it's going to take. We don't have a single database. We have a distributed database. Because the data is so big, it's spread out over many rows. When I'm doing that full way join with my left out of join, it's not doing equal join, it's saying equal join and not that table. So you can't do um, predicate lookups, you do them scans. How many server side messages is that going to take? Anyone? The answer is it's database specific. The better the database is, the less messages, and it depends. It can be a lot. So anyone can think of what I was talking about? Got me confused? That's, that's fine, that's complicated, it's not obvious. But if you think it's going to be magic and it goes slow and it's never found, then ask why. What's moving the measure the components? Okay, you've got to figure out where the bottleneck is in the schema. So just an example of splitting data of the many machines. So we've got four machines and we've got a customer table, let's spread the rows equally as possible. Does that make sense? Um, if everything was distributed by hatch, that would be fine. But when you do joins, you're going to be trucking rows from everywhere. It's just going to be inefficient. If you co-locate master detail rows, primary and primary keys, you can do joins locally. Local joins are fast. If you have an example of the table was used a lot, and you want to join them everywhere. If you just copy that table everywhere, you're going to get fast local joins. But if you copy it everywhere, it's going to take up space everywhere. So you're trading space for time. So in my project, we've got two different ways of doing it, by hatch, by reference, by reference. So the point being, when you do everything duplicate, it's really fast and local. If you join with hashes, you know, the more tables, the more rows, you're just going to be sending messages all day long. Doesn't matter what the technology is, the less message you send over the network, the faster it's going to go. The less we can do, the faster it goes. The more you do it in memory on a single box, the faster it goes. You may need a big cluster for capacity and throughput and availability, but sometimes the bigger the cluster is going to slow you down. It depends. So the marketing will say bigger is better. I'm saying it depends. So, what were some of the scalability challenges? We've talked about a lot of these things. When you're doing joins with hash distributions, it sucks. There's going to be messages. But without minimizing those messages. 
seven queries and updates, seven different tables doing hash lockups. So you're doing, you don't know where your data is. It could be on any of the nodes. Okay, so you're going to be doing messaging. Um, clients that are around hooks, we've talked about, not enough around in there, we've talked about open stack and neutral. Um, when I first did this benchmark, I did it in the Oracle Cloud because it's free for me. I did it on the customer's open stack network. Same data, same schema, same code, same problem. The only variable was their environment. We both use KVM, we both use, you know, they use um, CentOS, I use Oracle Linux, it's sitting in the place and things like that. the same thing. The difference was OpenStack Neutron was three times slower for reads and twice as slow for writes. So the difference was the network. You had double virtualization and it wasn't optimal. Three times slower. Not for the individual operations for the throughput. That is really significant. Believe me, don't believe me. I was shocked how much slower. But I use OpenStack a lot. For this particular customer, how they set it up, it was not optimal at all. So, those are the problems. How can we fix it? How can we address those things? When you have a distributed database, you've got to figure out how you distribute the data. I've talked about the three ways that we do it. Most databases are very similar. You can do it by hash. When you co-locate the data, we call it by reference. We can both do it by heap. So you have three choices per table. You have a lot of tables and a lot of choices. What's the optimal configuration? It depends. The theory is hard. The practice is a good way of doing it. If you're going to load a lot of data and compare it, it takes a long time. We created a thing called an index advisor to figure that out for you. It looks at the schema, you give it a representative workflow and it says, well, these tables use these distributions. It saves a lot of time. Likewise, what are the best indexes? I ended up using about 27 indexes. On Oracle, they used about 52 indexes. I'm, I like to think I'm fairly good at SQL tuning. I didn't choose an index. I used the index advisor 34. I just ran it and said, boom, here it is. I tried it and I got a number. I spent two weeks trying other indexes and it turned out the advice it gave me in seconds was actually the best. Um, what else? We all use SQL. Who knows about preparing and binding SQL statements? Who knows what that is? Who doesn't know what that is? Okay, if you use SQL and don't know what preparing and binding is, shame. <laughs> okay, <coughs> um, doesn't matter what database you use. If you have dynamic SQL, the database has to parse it. Is it semantic for it? Is it semantic for it? What data types do you use? What data value do you use? Once you know all that, the database will say, what is the best plan to execute that SQL? Will I do a full table scan? Will I do an index lockup? Will I use a bitmap index? It depends. But that's expensive. It can take a long time. It can take seconds. So you put here and bind once, and then execute again. If you just throw a SQL string at it with non, with local values, non-bind variables, it's going to be good for that expensive operation to just Keep going for it. But always be prepared to find your SQL statements. It was true 30 years ago, still true today. Check to explain that. Next thing is we don't normally network messaging. Logically, we can't change that. But physically, we can. Move the code to the data, not the data to the code. If you've got a client and a server, and you spend all your time shipping the code to and from the server to the client, if you move that business logic to the server, you can process it locally without any end results. It's called using a stored procedure. Oracle's had them for about 30 years. Sybase SQL server has this. Various databases have this. The point being, if you can run your SQL on the server and set it on the client, it goes faster. But you can also do business logic to make it all It makes it simpler. So if your database supports it, use stored procedures. So for the workload I was talking about, there's all those joins, the read workload, the, the writes, I measured it, I spent a hell out of it. It took 27 round cuts, best case. Still procedures down to two. One for the read, still procedure, one for the write, still procedure. Okay? 
Um, Four minutes or less. Actual data is, is distributed across many chains. Like when you've got lots of data, you have to distribute. Most of the time, you're distributing by cache because it's the simplest way given in distributing data. It's the best way. If you're just saying do an operation <coughs> and you don't know where the data is, you're going to connect to some of that. It's going to say, where is the data figured out? And that node's going to say, oh, it's local, I've done it, or it's not here. It's over there, and it's going to proxy that request over. Proxying a request over somewhere else is called a network proxy. So the point is, if you know where the data is, and process it, connect to and process it where the data is, you can avoid a network proxy. So we are distributing our data by cache. If you cache the value on the client without making network calls, it's making a local call. You do not hash value works. Given the hash value, you can then look at the distribution map in your database and say, which node has my data? If you know which node has your data, you can say, connect to that node when you do the SQL operation rather than some random one. So if I've got a 10 node cluster and I can say, process the data on the node, I have minimized my network cost. If I don't know where the data is, I've got a 90% chance of being wrong with a 10 node cluster. So the extra network hop like that. When you're network bound, every extra network hop makes things worse. Make sense? Okay, so there's a standard way of doing that. In JDK 9, there's a thing called the sharding API. So we do that. We also do with a bunch of different languages. Okay, running out of time. Two minutes or less. Time spent Scala is a database. It's a SQL database. It's an Amelia database. It's a transaction database. It's a passive database. It runs on a server. You need SQL, SQL, SQL to access it, and you use your favorite SQL API driver. We use the Oracle drivers. The way we invent drivers. SQL drivers take a long time to write. You know Oracle, you use your favorite Oracle driver. Whether it's .NET, or JDBC, or OCI, or C++, or R, or Python, pick your favorite language, don't care. We use the same one as the Oracle database. This database on prem runs on your favorite flavor of Linux. It runs in your favorite VM. It runs in your favorite container. It runs in Kubernetes or OpenStack. In the cloud, it's run on your favorite cloud. So I've gone way over time. So what I was talking about is scaling non-trivial applications. We have a trivial thing where the data is on a single table, a single row, you scale up vertically horizontally, it's a lot. It just doesn't exist in the real world. Most real world systems are far more complicated than that. When you've got real world systems, quite often you're dealing with crappy hardware, crappy software, you've got to make compromises. Those compromises will affect your throughput and scalability. So I looked at a customer use case where you probably were using it and techniques to minimize, so the, you know, the bottleneck isn't CPU bound, memory bound, IO bound, memory bound. In this case, it was memory bound. So I applied techniques to minimize the memory cost to allow it to scale. It scaled faster than a scale up your computer and scaled better than all the CPU and NoSQL memory that the customer had been using. So that was my talk. Any other questions? Thank you for your time.